I'm Stacy. I'm Jenny. And this is Learning for Life, a homeschool podcast. We are two homeschoolers who use different methods, curriculum, and strategies to make it all work. Our goal is to help parents teach kids how to develop a lifelong love of learning. Welcome back to the Learning for Life podcast. I'm excited for this episode. This is one I've been wanting to do for a while. Today, we will be answering the questions that we get asked the most frequently by our audience. Yes. And if you are new here, where have you been? Like, go back, (laughs) listen to some of our other episodes. This is kind of our final episode for this season two of our podcast. Um, I'm Stacy and Jenny, you just heard, and we are your hosts. And we discuss all things related to homeschooling and helping you instill a love of learning in your children. So really go back and listen to the other ones too. Yeah, you can see all of our resources, including show notes for this episode at our website, which is kidslearningforlife.com. And one thing, one announcement I just wanted to make here really quick at the beginning of our episode, we have a 2021 audience survey that we will link to in the show notes as well. And if you complete the survey by December 17th, 2021, then you will be entered in a giveaway to win a $25 Amazon gift card. The reason we're doing the survey is because we just, we want to get a really good idea as to like what our audience wants to see and hear from us. So any feedback that you have for us really, really helps. Yes, it's really, really important. So we love hearing uh, from you guys in our Instagram DMs or our YouTube comments or just on Facebook. But uh, the survey is going to kind of hone in on some of those questions we're wondering um, to make sure we're giving you guys the best content moving forward. Right. Okay. Well, let's get to our list of questions, Stacy. I don't want to beat around the bush too long. You ready? Let's do it. Okay. Let's start with the first question that I saw actually recently. And this question is, what was your inspiration to homeschool? Do you want to start answering that one first? Ooh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I had always like enjoyed the idea of homeschooling, but coming from a teaching background, it was not like in my mind, like I was going to get my teaching credential and then my kids were going to, you know, go to school and I try to like work at the same school they were at if possible. (laughs) And it would just be like, you know, going through the public school system. Um, But it wasn't until um, it really helped that I had other family uh, like you and we have a cousin that were very homeschool knowledgeable, or at least knew they wanted to homeschool. So that kind of at least opened the doors to me to start thinking about it. And um, really, the more and more, like as my children started growing up and I was finishing my credential, I realized I really love teaching and my favorite people to teach are my own children. Imagine that. Any of the kids I taught. I know. But um, it's just, it was really fun. And so I ran a daycare um, when my kids were, you know, two to five-ish. And it was just really fun being home the whole day. And so I also had other kids there too. And, but I just, it was really interesting how people are, will send their kids to daycare. And then, you know, there's a lot of like, oh, I missed their first steps or, oh, I missed their first words um, or whatever, because your kid was like at daycare at the time. But you don't see people having that same kind of like sadness over, oh, I missed getting to see my kid learn to read, or I missed getting my, to see my kid do that experiment in school. Um, And so that was something that I started thinking about. And I really wanted to see all of those moments, not just their first steps or their first words, but to see kind of all of their little aha moments. So I don't know. That was kind of my inspiration was I just I wanted to hang out with my kids um, and get to be with them. So homeschooling looked like a really awesome option. Our journeys are kind of our, our reasons are kind of different because I was never going to be an educator necessarily. I wasn't going mm-hmm. to school to be a teacher like I but I always knew that I was going to be teaching my own kids. And this is because I think between my husband and I who had polar opposite uh like situ- learning situations in public school and experiences um I think between the two of us neither of us were happy with what we experienced and the outcome and we just knew that we could do better for our kids. So I, I've always gravitated towards the concept of homeschooling. I had wished all throughout when I was growing up that I could have been homeschooled. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I just I just feel like this is my way to give the best possible education 
to my kids. And I know that's kind of a very abstract concept for people who are just so used to the public school system, but when you really think about it, who better to teach your kids than you? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the second question. Do you want to ask this one, Stacy? Yeah. So, Jenny, I would love to know, <laughs> along with our listeners, mm-hmm. what has been your biggest struggle with homeschooling? Wow. I have not thought about this at all. So this is I haven't either, cuff. so I'm glad you went first. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll, I'll break the ice here. I think, hmm, I think my biggest struggle, and I think maybe you're going to say the same thing here, Stacey. I think my biggest struggle is time. I think it's like the whole routine and schedule thing, which I'm not a big routine and schedule person, but just the way that my family's like schedule is with our jobs and everything it's just hard to find the time it's hard to have a consistent schedule so I've really been grasping onto certain concepts like keep lessons short um you know do some free reading Friday type things where you don't have to sit down and do formal lessons on certain days of the week you know that kind of thing um but it it's it's been hard so what about you Stacy? what's your biggest struggle that's really interesting. And I wonder, um, because you and I both work full time, because um, I, I would have to agree, that's not what I'm going to say, but I oh. do agree with the whole, whole time constraint is, um, you know, just because when you are working full time, like my, what I'm going to say is kind of the expectation versus reality of homeschool. Mm. And I I imagine homeschool being a certain way and then I get really bummed out when that's not the way it ends up being because of various different things like time constraints or I had a busier week at work so I um, had to like pass off some of the homeschooling or just had to do a lot of independent, you know, had my boys do a lot of independent homeschooling that week um, because it, you know, we're busy. And I think with homeschooling, what I'm having to get used to is when you homeschool, it is your um, your life. Like it is just mm-hmm. part of your life rather than, you know, if you send your kids to public school, there's a very routine. You know, it's very hard to like get out of that routine because it's, it's there. Like you send your kids and then you don't have to do anything more about it. Um, but here it's like one little thing comes up or one little like house project that needs to get fixed. Now – you know, it does impact your homeschooling because you can't just send your kid away and then fix that problem while they're gone. Um, right. So that has been my biggest struggle is just I know what I want my perfect ideal homeschool day to look like. Um, and, you know, there's times where it does look like that and then other times where it doesn't. So it's kind of like I'll beat myself up over it, which I shouldn't because well, it's, that, that's what I'm trying to yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say something that's a struggle for you, maybe more so than just like a person in the wild who homeschools is, and I know a lot of people in your same situation that are teachers that homeschool, mm-hmm. you have to constantly be reassessing what your concept of education is, right? So you went to school yes. for however many years and you went to get this teaching credential and so you think of standards you think of you know this is what needs to be done x y and z but homeschool doesn't look like that even if you Mm -hmm. want it to it doesn't always look like that so um and I know that you like know teachers who homeschool as well and I'm sure it's a thing it's just like the way that you're wired and the way you've been trained doesn't necessarily correspond exactly with teaching at home you know what I mean I think, yeah, I think you're very true. And I think some of it also might just stem from my job because I work at a charter school. Um, So, you know, we have to be that more educational, like, resource to the the families that we work with. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, like, always in that mindset of, you know, what's, like like you said, like, what's the standards? What's this? Because that's what I'm constantly looking for for, in other families. And um, but so I think, yeah, it's just really hard to get out of that mindset. And, um, you know, not that my kids aren't meeting standards, But doing it just in a way that comes naturally is kind of, you know, the standards is you do this in first grade, this in third grade, this in eighth grade. And so it's just really hard to get pull myself out of that mindset. So, yeah, I think that would be the hardest thing so far. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. This is a question. Our next question is one that we've actually gotten twice recently via email from two different people. And it was just funny because both emails were almost exactly the same. So I'm going to ask it here just in case any of our listeners have this same concern. So um, 
basically it's my child can read and enjoys reading but is terrible at spelling what do you recommend like are there curriculums that you recommend what should I do here what do you think Stacy? Wow. So that's, and that's a great question. I remember having this response when we were looking at those mm-hmm. because currently, and please email us at kidslearningforlife at gmail.com if you're, if you have some data, but I don't, I have not been putting a lot of stock in my own kids spelling. Um, we've been focusing a lot on reading, um, but I do know like all about reading is a curriculum Jenny and I both use and love but they also have an all about spelling program. So as you learn to read, they teach all these different sounds. And so then basically they do the same thing for spelling so that you know all the rules and how do you know when it's going to be an I before the E and all this stuff. So that is something that I would recommend to people. But for us, we, I'm just kind of, you know, as they're writing, if they ask me how to spell a word, I'll let them know. And it's just a lot of repetition through seeing words when they're reading and then also repetition when they're writing. My husband and I actually have had this discussion where um, in school I remember like, oh, just use your best guess spelling. And the way my husband's wired, he's like that just in school when he did that threw him for a loop. And he's like, I think that's why I'm so bad at spelling because I would just best guess it Mm -hmm. and then it would kind of get ingrained into his head how he spelled it. Yeah. Because – it, you know, it's not like the teacher, they'll grade it and give it back to you. But then do kids really look and go, oh, look at these words I spelled wrong. I better memorize these. No, they don't. Right. So he's all for like when the kids ask how to spell a word right then and there, we need to like help them kind of see how to spell the word mm-hmm. so that they're spelling it right. You know, not getting like, you know, super hardcore every time they spell a word wrong being crazy, but just for those different words that they need more help with. I also this year had my third grader because he's in that that realm of those questions where he's just he's not the greatest at spelling. Um, But I did have him use Typing Club's spelling program. So again, just getting him used to seeing different words and having to spell them out. So that's what we do. But what about you, Jenny? Okay, so it's interesting because so the two emails we got consecutively one I think was talking about apps or something like that. The second one was asking from a more Charlotte Mason perspective. So that's why I responded to that one because I'm like, okay, I can help you here. So obviously like, you know, I'm going to recommend something like all about spelling because I trust the all about reading program. Right. But Mm -hmm. if we're talking about it from a more Charlotte Mason type of approach, like a little more hands off, like don't worry about it so much type thing. I would just say keep exposing your kid to books. So have them read. Mm -hmm. They will see how words are spelled and hopefully pick up on those patterns. Um, Also, copy work, which is a big part of the Charlotte Mason method. It's all about just copying exactly what you see. And like what you were saying, Stacey, about correcting them immediately, that is a big part of the Charlotte Mason method. You want your kids to get into good habits. So you don't want them spelling something wrong once and then let it like you know, sweep it under the rug or whatever, you need mm-hmm. to have them correct it immediately. So even if this means they only write one copywork sentence a day, then that means you do that one copywork sentence and make sure it's perfect before they call it a day. So that's what I recommend for spelling. Like you, I'm not that concerned about spelling <laughs> because yeah. I just feel like it's going to come in time. And yeah, I think we we pretty much agree on that, Stacy. You could just talk about spelling all day, apparently. I didn't know you had this spelling so. queen no. thing in you. <laughs> and I, spelling was never one of my favorite subjects in school anyway. So, I mean, I don't know. I feel like I'm decent in spelling. Um, but, yeah, it's just like, I'm just like, whatever. Yeah. Okay, so our next question, Jenny, is um, from some of our listeners have been looking for some more open and go curriculum ideas. And I know you and I love these because Mm -hmm. we are so busy. So what are some of your favorites? Some of my favorite open and go curriculum. First of all, anything open and go is automatically my favorite. (laughs) So some of my personal favorites that we still use every day are things like for math, primary mathematics. Stacy and I both use this curriculum. We can't mm-hmm. we can't stop talking about it. Like it's the only math curriculum for us. Uh, we in my homeschool we have always used Explode the Code, which is a phonics curriculum, but there it goes up to like level eight. So it's like a reading and writing curriculum for anyone, I believe. 
And then there's also a like a sister program called Beyond the Code, which my older daughter is using to practice reading comprehension. So these are all extremely open and go, and they're very affordable, all of these options. They're just workbooks, essentially. Uh, for something like science, which is tougher, if all you need is something open and go and you're not picky, there's all sorts of science workbooks, like Evan Moore is one we've used. Um, do you have a science workbook that you've used, Stacy? I feel like there's one that you've recommended to me before. Um, well, I do know that Studies Weekly is, um, they have history and science. Mm. And so I can consider them a little more open and go because they, they, they kind of look like newspapers. That's like the student text is each week they get a different little newspaper. Um, and same thing with science and history. And then on that, you know, it's just a, a four page like newspaper thing. And then there's reading that they do and then there's some activities on the back that they can complete or like an experiment so if you do the experiment you have to look ahead a little bit but um that that's kind of my history in science like open and go um i have moved away from it because i'm trying to do more family style for history and science Um, but when i used it it was very easy to just pull out here's this week's little newspaper let's read it let's do the activities and we could move on (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And that's one. Yeah. You've shown me that and it's pretty cool. So yeah, I mean, there's so many different open and go. Oh, uh, there's also lightning literature. If you're looking for something kind of Charlotte Mason-y, other than the fact that you have to make sure you have the texts on hand, because like every week you Mm -hmm. do a little, another little picture book and then the child responds to what they read basically in the lightning literature curriculum. But they do sell packages that sell the entire set of books, which is really cool. So if you're able to buy the entire package then go for it because then you're going to have it all on hand and it's super easy and they're all really good books too yeah and so that's actually something I've been trying to do with the history and science curriculum I looked at um I decided this year during the summer to look ahead and just get everything I needed for it to make the curriculum as open and go friendly as possible for me I like it um just to cut down on my prep so like you said I looked ahead at all the science experience experiments and made sure that I had all those materials so when that week came I wasn't like oh we can't do this because I don't have you know x y and z um but also I used, um, they had student texts and I made sure to print those out ahead of time instead of just printing them off one week at a time. Um, so I actually sent the PDF document to our friend over at Humble Press, Humble Heart Press, I'm sorry. And she had them, the student workbooks printed for me and I had one for each student and bam, like that way the workbook portion was, hey guys, open up this, let's do it. Even though I was so pro at the beginning of my homeschool career, like I would buy a workbook and like make copies so I could save it for my next child. But that is so time consuming. And I probably Mm -hmm. was spending more on ink and paper than if I, than like the $6 workbook that I was trying to like save. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, again, if you're like in a super money crunch, then yes, go for it. But again, like I said, I'm probably spending more on the ink and paper than if I was just buy a second workbook when my next kid was that age. I feel like everyone goes through like a copy and printing phase in their homeschool. And then they're quickly like, I mean, depending on how many kids they have, they're like, yeah, can't do this anymore. So exactly. I I get that. Okay. I have a question. This might be a better question to ask me, um, but I will read it and then we can respond. The question is, I don't like planning ahead. So how do I create a homeschool schedule and routine? There are like, I'm noticing again, I I think this is kind of a theme that maybe you have probably noticed too, Jenny, is like, again, that expectation at the beginning of when I started homeschooling is totally different than what I'm doing now. And as my kids are learning and growing, like the the homeschool schedule routine is constantly changing Mm -hmm. all the time. So it is really hard um, because there was one year and I made a video on this and I still really love what I did. Um, But I planned out my whole year, like week by week, this is what I'm going to do. I have to get this many pages through this book. Um, But what I found was, again, because sometimes we'd go faster or slower, I was constantly having to go back and change it. Um, So I like doing that just to know this is like give myself a goal. This is where I want to be by the end of the year. But at the same time, like things change. So if you if you do try to plan too far ahead, you're probably doing more work for yourself because you're going to have to go back and change it anyway. So that's mm-hmm. my, my biggest advice is don't try to plan too far ahead. Yeah. Um, but 
creating a homeschool schedule and routine, that is going to change. So find something that you think is going to work well for you. And, you know, it depends on your family lifestyle and everything is what decide what you're going to like be firm on. Cause that's something I've been trying to work on currently is, you know, there's the mornings it needs to be, you know, this time, this time has to be focused on doing homeschool because if it doesn't get done in the morning, it's really hard to try and bring the kids in from outside and have them do work, you know, in the evenings when I'm off work. So you really just need to know what's important to you and try to stick to that as much as possible. I hope that made sense. Yeah, totally. And so my advice, I'm less of a planner than Stacy. So I'm actually kind of shocked by her answer <laughs> because <laughs> she, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, actually, you don't, you don't need to do too much. Um, I, I found, so I've always like wanted to buy those really beautiful planners and they're almost always like uh, weekly or monthly planners. And that has just never worked in our family ever. I think it's just because of my husband's job and now I'm working too. So all this stuff, it just doesn't work to plan our lives ahead that much because it will just never happen. And that's what Stacy's planning video was. It was more of a yearly plan. So planning ahead mm -hmm. how many chapters of what you want to get through in this week. You know, that kind of thing. Which is cool. And that's actually probably something I should stick to a little bit better. But what I've been doing is just daily planning. So every day I will go in, or even the previous night, I will go in and look at the upcoming pages of my kids curriculum. So we do math and phonics every day. So I'll look and see, okay, they could easily do this page in a day. So I'm going to assign this page and then like, say I go over to their next curriculum and it looks a little bit harder. I'll be like, okay, you need to do problems one through five on this page. Let's just say, I mean, that's, that's just an example. And so that way I'm setting goals for us for that day. And then once we're done with that, then we move on. And then the next day I plan out what we do for that day. Or if we're busy, then we don't do the typical sit down and learn and do lessons type thing. So for us, it's very fluid and that's why it's it, it works to do it daily. And I've even gotten Stacy hooked on a daily planner, which has been working for each of us. Um, and yeah, I'm just not big on schedules, really. I guess a routine is more my jam. I don't want to plan too far ahead, but I think it is good to have a routine and habits in your homeschool. But I don't necessarily I'm I'm not like jumping at the chance to like schedule my homeschool months out because I'm just going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, schedule is like so when I think of scheduling, I think like eight o'clock to nine o'clock. We're doing this nine o'clock to this o'clock. And like a routine is more like the time doesn't necessarily matter. It's just the order that things are done. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be as broad, like for the whole day, or it could just be, hey, we're doing school. And so in school, here's the routine that we do. So like um, I've actually, again, I I have gone away currently from that yearly plan and I go, go more weekly. And I have it set out where Mondays, because I know like the kids' activities, so I know that we have less time on certain days. So I say, okay, on Mondays, you have to do this, this, and this. And I have a little checklist. But that way, at least they the kids know what subjects they have to do each day. And that really helps because they know, oh, it's a Monday, so I have to do math and reading and and science. I don't know what, what we, I can't remember what we do on Mondays. <laughs> um, so so the routine is more just like, it's not time specific. It's just kind of like, oh, this is what we are normally doing on this day. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what I like. I think I've heard people um, refer to their routine as more of like a rhythm, which I mm -hmm. like that term because that is how it is. Like sometimes my kids sleep in and, and they're not out of bed and have eaten breakfast until like 10 a.m. So I can't say, yes. I, I can't get mad <laughs> that that they slept in because, I mean, we homeschool. How dare you miss math and reading today? <laughs> yeah, it's like this isn't a real school. Like they're not going to get expelled because they're not showing up. Like we just make it show up for them. So I yes. just, it, yeah, I, I'm not big on schedule, but yeah, routine, I think it is good to get into good habits. And now it's time for a quick break, so stick around. Audiobooks are an amazing way to fit more stories into your everyday life. And there is no easier way to listen to audiobooks than with Audible. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks anywhere, so you're sure to find the books you're looking for. 
no wait times, and no poor audio quality here. My current favorite books on Audible are Treasure Island, read by Alfred Molina, which is great for kids, and it was the first audiobook my kids and I enjoyed together. I also love the book True Grit by Charles Portis, read by Donna Tart. That one's more for grown-ups, but it's still really enjoyable. Again, click the link in the show notes below to get a free month of Audible. And now back to the show. Okay, Stacy, I want to ask you this next question because I think you're going to have an answer for it, hopefully. So some people have asked us about unit studies. And a specific question that I know I've gotten is, how do I create a unit studies curriculum for my homeschool? Okay. Um, and I wish I had like a grand, like perfect answer here. Um, and I also, if you don't know, I do love the idea of unit studies because I, I like how you know, when you're doing a science lesson, it, it carries over into math and science, math and reading, and it you can learn about the history of it and kind of tie all the subjects together. So I definitely love that. Um, if you're doing it from scratch, it is very time consuming. So you might have guessed since all of my questions so far, time is not my friend currently. Um, there's just a lot going on and I, I love open and go curriculums for a reason. So I'm not the best person to ask, how do you create a unit studies curriculum? But what, um, I mean, there actually, we should probably pull in some of our own um, followers and listeners because I, we follow some of them on like Instagram and there are some of our listeners that are just rocking the unit studies. I look at it, I'm like, oh wow, that is so cool. Like, I wish you wrote everything down and I could just copy what you did because I'm always looking for things that are already done for me. Um, that's just what I, the stage I'm at. I just, I need all the ideas there. So that's why I loved Layers of Learning, which was a history, science, geography, and art curriculum. Um, and it was family style. So it was really nice, again, trying to teach all the kids at once, trying to kind of cover all the topics with the same main idea. But um, it still took a little too much planning for what I needed. So my biggest goal with unit studies is just looking for something, looking for a curriculum that is mostly done for you. And I know, I'm pretty sure the Gather Round Homeschool does this really, really well. Um, I'm really tempted to start looking into that because I do know a, another family that uses it and just all the stuff they do looks so cool. So that's my best. I, I Again, I have not fully dived into that curriculum. Um, I do know it's religious based if that matters to you. But I just for me, I'm always just looking for a good curriculum that's already done for me, not recreating the wheel, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think a lot of people are drawn to unit studies like you are. And so and some people might not like certain components of certain unit studies curriculums that already exist. So like some people who have the time and energy would love to create their own. And Stacy has actually created a toddler and preschool curriculum that is a unit studies type curriculum for the younger kids. So you're definitely in that that universe and you're in that mindset yes, sometimes. That was back when I had more time. For right. Sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Not anymore because your kids were not homeschool you, age I, yet. That, that's actually weird. Yeah, I know. Uh, you would think, how, how did she have more time when she had all these toddlers? When, when you had a, I don't yeah, know. when you had a daycare and three kids under the age of four, but yeah. I don't know. It was a different time. They, they napped. That was very helpful. <laughs> that's true. Yes. Okay. Remember nap time? Oh, well, I mean- like, I still, still have one. Yeah, I still have a toddler, and my older kids are old enough to, like, pretty much take care of themselves. So I'm like, I mean, nap time's great. I'm still in that in that world. <laughs> Ugh, I'm jealous. <laughs> okay, so Jenny, our next question is mostly for you. Um, I, by knowing Jenny, I realize I'm probably more Charlotte Mason than I like to admit, but <laughs> I'm going to leave this question up to you. Um, some people have been asking, how do I approach the Charlotte Mason method? That's a big question. It is a big question, and I'm not going to be able to answer it like at all eloquently or really even very complete. But so yeah, Stacy is a closet Charlotte Mason person, okay? She doesn't realize it, but she is, um, which is something about the Charlotte Mason method that I love is I, I just end up seeing it everywhere. Once I, once I heard about it, I was like, wow, like every book I read, these, the, the themes are so much like based in like what Charlotte Mason taught, which, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether they were trying to or not. So anyway, 
Charlotte Mason. Okay. So there are several different components to the Charlotte Mason method. I'm not going to get into those right now, but what I will say is that at its core, the Charlotte Mason method is a homeschool method that is based on the use of living books. And living books are quality classic literature. So a lot of these are very old books. There are some contemporary books that I think would qualify, but for the most part, they are books that have stood the test of time. So for an example, for history, the book, other than the story of the world curriculum that we use, we are also reading our island story, which is a history of England for boys and girls. That's the tagline of the book. And it is incredible. And I am just so, I just feel so fortunate that we found this book. We found it through the Ambleside Online Curriculum, which is a free Charlotte Mason curriculum online. So that's just one example of a book that is super accessible. It's in the free domain. So if you wanted to print it out yourself, you can for free. And yeah, I just think that um, I'm, I love literature. I love books. So this is just like the method for me. And I wish that I was educated with the Charlotte Mason education growing up, but I'm kind of doing that for myself now, which is cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I would say if anyone is interested in the Charlotte Mason method, obviously I can't go too much in depth right now, but if you go on Ambleside Online, which is one of many Charlotte Mason curriculums, but it's the one that I have gravitated towards, they have a whole frequently asked questions section on their website. It's super long, but if you want to get an idea as to who Charlotte Mason was, what the method consists of, what are the right and wrong ways to do it? then I would go there. And that website is what really made me fall in love with the Charlotte Mason method. So I just, I say start there and just throw away any textbooks you have and <laughs> learn from living books. But that's a whole other conversation. So that is, that's how I would approach it if I were brand new to Charlotte Mason. That, that's brilliant. And I know Jenny is, has a bunch of ideas for like some Charlotte Mason videos she wants to do on our YouTube channel. So be on the lookout for those if you're interested because she's going to walk you through step by step some of these these topics that are common. Yes. Yeah. Because in Charlotte Mason, there's all sorts of like, there's a whole new lexicon you need to learn. Like there's all these terms and it's like, what is that? What is that? So I'm trying to just make it as simple as possible for people because it can be overwhelming. But I just, I believe so strongly in this homeschool method that I just feel like everyone should at least hear about it so they know what it is before just writing it off as some old British lady making up educational you know, goals and standards, you know, it's, it's not, yeah. it's not quite that it's, it's, it is a lifestyle in a way, but, um, okay, let's move on to the next question, Stacy. And okay. I, I'm going to ask you this, but we can both answer, um, because we both have these, we both have extracurriculars that our kids do. So how do we add these to our homeschool routine? I'm not quite sure. There's not enough time in the day. Um, <laughs> but let's see. So adding extracurriculars, I think there's a couple different components because extracurriculars, like I'm thinking of things such as like PE classes, you know, music lessons, choir, um, you know, horseback riding lessons, like other interests that your child might have. Um, these can get expensive. So that is one thing to think about. Like, I would love to have my kids like in horseback riding lessons, but they're, they can be expensive. And um, so <laughs> my kids are not doing that right now, unfortunately. <laughs> I would love it. Um, but so you kind of have to keep in mind like cost when you're looking into certain extracurriculars because there are some that are going to be more expensive than others. Um Right now, we're just looking at extracurriculars as just another chance to get out of the house and um, have the kids learn from somebody that's not mom or dad. Um, and, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, I, I like the kids enjoy chatting with other kids, not like they don't get socialization other places, but that's also just a small little benefit. But it is nice, like, I don't know if you get the same thing, but it it's interesting to see how they react to somebody else telling them what to do, like another adult or high schooler, because our kids do like a gymnastics um, ninja warrior type thing. And so they're all like younger, like, you know, maybe just finished high school, college. And so just having them have to get instructions from somebody else is really interesting to watch. But yeah, we just add extracurriculars as we have time. 
and also looking at the money. So they, they do like two. So right now they're doing like choir and they're doing this um, Ninja Warrior type thing. So that's two nights a week. And again, because we live so rural, it's really hard. I'm trying to find things that are around us that are like a 10 minute drive. But just to get out of our little area is a 10 minute drive. So it's mm-hmm. just really hard in that aspect. When we used to live in our other house close to the city, it, there were so many things, you know, in a like 10 minute radius that you could go to. But so now we have to be a little more picky and choosy. I don't know if that answers the question. Well, but. yeah. So I think you did. I think you talked about why extracurriculars are important, which I agree. And I don't think there's an easy answer to how to add extracurriculars to your homeschool routine because, I mean, whether we like it or not, I do think that ex- extracurriculars kind of disrupt a typical routine. Say you're yes. say you're trying to do f- five days a week of, you know, this is what we do. This is we do this subject, then this subject. But the fact of the matter is that they do disrupt your homeschool routine, but we don't need to make that a negative thing. Uh, for mm-hmm. example, my kids do piano. Well, that's one of their extracurriculars. And it's it's been a little bit of a transition. And they've almost been doing it for a year now. But, you know, making that extra time every day to practice and then making the time for their lesson, which luckily our teacher comes to our house. But I know a lot of people do have to travel for that kind of thing. And so that's a whole other time constraint that you have. But I do think, like you were saying extracurriculars are really important and they're worth doing at least in moderation like I feel like I feel like if every kid kid took some sort of music class or did some sort of sport I think that would be great for them is you know as long as your budget and your schedule allow but yeah there's no real easy way to add extracurriculars because the whole point is that they're extra curricular so they're outside yes. of your curriculum so and it's going to yeah. depend on the interest of your kids, yeah, exactly you know, what your budget and time schedule looks like. So extracurriculars are going to look totally different from each homeschool, just like every homeschool looks totally yeah. different. Yeah, like Stacy and I, we both do. Well, actually, right now we actually do similar extracurriculars. But up until now, oh, yeah. it was um, kind of we were doing kind of different types of things. And uh, so it's, it's just very interesting. But that's just, you know, what our kids wanted to do or what's near our house or what kind of fit in our lifestyle. So. Yeah, it's different for everyone, but I I do recommend making room for at least some sort of extracurricular in your life if your kids are feeling compelled to do something else. (laughs) Uh, Okay, I think we're on our last question now, Stacey. Can you believe it? No, I can't. I didn't <laughs> think we'd get through them this fast. I know so, Stacy's I don't know like if this is fast. If you're listening and you're like, "Wow, when are they going to end?" Like, <laughs> they would have just turned it off. <laughs> oh, very uh, true. But, so thank you for, if you're still here. Yeah. So Stacy and I saw this last question, and we felt it was really important to include in here, and so we're going to end on this one. So this one is. Do you have any tips for not getting overwhelmed? There are so many curriculums and methods to research, and so much to prep for. So, Stacy, how do you want to lead us off on this one? Again, another big question here. Um, tips for not getting overwhelmed. Like I said, I'm still currently struggling with this, but throw away, like, have an expectation in your mind, but just throw away the fact that you're ever going to get there. Um, it'll <laughs> help you so much in the beginning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and just, just know that it's going to change, because I think that's the biggest thing is that my my goal some like the overall goal of our of our homeschool is to have our kids love to learn to ask questions to want to learn more about topics like that's a very broad goal and we can complete that goal in so many different ways so mm-hmm. having a big overall goal is great but then if you're imagining oh our homeschool is we're going to wake up at eight o'clock and we're going to start reading like as you start getting more detailed you don't you don't know what your homeschool is going to look like in six months. I don't know what my homeschool is going to look like. I don't, I, th- this is how I have had my homeschool journey is it's constantly changing every six months. Um, there's one curriculum. Maybe we change out, like even from the beginning of this school year, I added two new like curriculum things and took out another one. So had at the beginning of the school year, I had this plan and I already had to change it. So just to better fit the needs of the, of my boys and so by not getting overwhelmed let's see um that's kind of the just the overall aesthetic of homeschooling just know that it's going to change and 
yes, there are so many curriculums. There are so many methods. And you will learn what works for you as you go. And I hated that advice <laughs> when I was researching. That's stuff. the worst advice like, to hear. <laughs> I know it is. And but as but now that I'm like have been doing this for several years, it's, it's the most true advice that I can give is that it's kind of uh, so random tangent, when I was giving my children like baby food, like they were in the baby food stage, somebody told me, oh, I love that stage, but it goes so fast. But to me, picking out the right kind of baby food and which one to buy and how often I had to buy it, how much my kids eating was my entire life in that phase of my life, um, that it was so important. I was like, what do you mean it goes by fast? I, you know, they're going to eat this for like two years, you know, not two years, I'm sorry, what, six months to a year, they're going to be on this baby food. That's all they can eat or whatever. But that time goes by so fast. And when I look back, I'm like, oh, wow, baby food was such a small little portion of my life. So I guess that's what I'm trying to get at here is that the curriculum you choose will probably, it might change, it might not. Um, but it's going to be such a small little portion when kind of the bigger things are, are you, you know, are your children enjoying learning? So what advice do you have, Jenny, for how to not be overwhelmed? Well, yeah, that's a really big question. Like you said, um, it's kind of funny because my response is, I mean, it's similar to yours. I, And that's totally like just you need to kind of like throw everything out the window, right? Like throw all your expectations out. But I also think this is one thing that you and I have talked about a lot is coming up with your why, which is really, really important, yes. which that's something you kind of did talk about, about like, what's your number one goal? But also, I do think it's good. I think the first thing that you should research if you're going to do research is research methods first, because once you have some sort of guiding principle, then I feel like everything else comes so easily. You're not going to spend a bunch of money on curriculum that you d that's just not going to work for you. Like, as long as you have somewhat of a direction in which to go, then you won't feel so overwhelmed because the other choices are not options for you anymore. So that is so true. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, when you know kind of the method or the philosophy, like coming up with your why and then finding a method that works, then you can search that method and they will recommend curriculums for you. Yeah, it makes it so much easier. Like for me, I mean, I know I talk about Charlotte Mason all the time, but it makes things so much easier because when I'm going through the Rainbow Resource catalog, I know I'm not going to choose the one that says it's traditional method because in the catalog, they like have little icons mm -hmm. for each like what method a curriculum fits into so like if I see traditional or if I see um let's say Waldorf or Montessori I'm like okay well that's probably not for me so I'm going to look for the things that are more for me which is more classical or Charlotte Mason based so yeah I do think as long as you have some sort of like you just need to narrow your view because I agree there are 10 million different options out there for language arts but if you just have some sort of small narrowing of your eyes and vision, it's so much easier. Trust me. Jenny, that's a perfect note for us to just kind of end on. That was brilliant. I love it. Okay. Well, let's wrap this up. And we want to make a quick announcement before the end of the show today. Um, we are going to be taking a bit of a break from the podcast. It's not forever. So don't worry if you're a fan of the show. Um we are ramping up to two YouTube videos every week, though. Currently, we just do one, but we're ramping up to two on YouTube, and we're going to see how that goes. So that's why we're taking a short break from the podcast. When we return to the podcast, we will be coming back with consistent homeschool how-to episodes and the occasional interview with a guest here on the podcast. So stay tuned for that. As always, we really enjoy interacting with all of you, either through our email or our Instagram account. Um, so you can find us on Facebook and Instagram and even our YouTube channel. If you watch some of those videos, comment there. We love hearing that. And you can email us anytime with any homeschool questions at kidslearningforlife at gmail.com. Also, the last little thing I wanted to mention is if you do want to connect with us and be able to ask, you know, those little questions, we do have a Facebook homeschool group. It's called the Kids Learning for Life homeschool group. So we'll leave a link to that in the show notes. So you can check out there. We post um, some random tips and things in there. So that's another way you can kind of connect with us. And with that, it's time to say, see you next time. 
See you next time. <laughs> Throw mine in there too. Okay. <laughs>